Thank you for joining us. Welcome back. We have our first segment. Uh, we have with us on set the Honorable Dale Caetano, who is the director of Belize's Family Court. Morning, Dale. Good morning, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Marlon, thanks for having me also. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys. Well, Dale, this is the April 1st, 1989. Right. Um, the Family Court was first started, so we're edging up on the 30th anniversary of right. the institution. Um, I wanted to start off by having you describe uh, where the institution is, um, and then I want to follow up on one other question after right. finish. Okay. From the court first started on um, 1st April 1989, um, I'm not sure if I want to put this question to Marlene, but maybe to Kevin. <laughs> I if you quite I was already born. <laughs> <laughs> I if you quite remember where, 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 where the social building was on Church Street yes. in front. Okay, uh, right. do you do remember? <laughs> All right. Uh, All right. That's where the first family court building was. Yeah. Um, at that time, uh, Justice Singh was the was the judge of the, of the family court, himself and magistrate, and you also had four intake officers, right. and that's the genesis of the family court. You know, Neil, we have. We've had in the police force mm -hmm. an officer who started off um, without a high school diploma and made himself up as top cop. Right. But your story is also one of making your way all the way through the public service. Right. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? And we are proud to have somebody who has made their way through the system. Um, I guess that's the best of the public service. The public service is a, is a vehicle where, you ca where one can start off with minimum qualification and then from there use the service to elevate themselves with hard work and ambition. I must say when I started out um, in 19, I won't say here because I might sell my age. <laughs> I, um, I finished, I went to, to, to do a second at the time, which is E.P. York. I went to be in college and then I was, you know, looking for a job. And next, next year, you know, I went to the Treasury, applied for a job as a messenger. And so um, they offered me a job as a messenger at the Treasury Department. It was no problem for me. Um, the salary was a really meager salary, but I, I said, you know. Salary. You remember salary? <laughs> <laughs> so I took, I, took the, I took that challenge and um, um, from there I worked myself up. I went to the clerical ranks, um, second class, first class. And then I, um, I worked at several departments. I worked at, at the BDF, account, BDF um, pay office, post office, supplies control. And um, then from there, um, while I was working in public service, I also went to school. I did my paralegal. Um, I, I, then from there I, I was transferred to the family court as the clerk of court. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I went to law school. Came back as a magistrate at the magistrate court. And then in April, I was promoted to director of Belize Family Court. In 2015? In 2015, yes. first April 2015. Now that we've had the, the history out of the way, and I think the history is significant, both of, of your experience in the system and also of the family court itself. I think people don't always know um, the purpose as to why there is a separate entity called the family court that works within our judicial system um, and its primary objectives as to uh, how you function differently than, than the type of justice one would get in a magistrate court or the Supreme Court. Can we start there in, in terms of understanding the work the court does? Right, because for the court, we have two mandates. One is that we are family court, and we also do juvenile matters. Yes. So I guess they are, they are all intertwined, no? they are not separate. Mm -hmm. And the thing about family court is that, for example, if you do a criminal matter at magistrate court, if the matter is finished, that's and assist you in the type of um, mm -hmm. problems that you have. Mm -hmm. The last resort is that we go to the court, in front of a magistrate, when we feel like, Everything I've done to try to assist that family, and then that's the last resort. That's where that's where go go, um, go legal. And the juvenile justice portion. Um, that the juvenile justice um, is that the the, pur the purpose for that is that first of all, um, when you are a juvenile, we have to understand that you should be treated differently from what we call the seasoned criminals or or, or or the more mature persons. Is that we need to be treated them differently that they when they go to court, first of all, it is held in camera. And the media is not allowed to say anything about that juvenile. We believe that every juvenile can be and should be rehabilitated. So we try to, and prison is the last option for any juvenile. So we'll, when they go to the court, we'll have the, 
the um, the CRO with them, so that will the community so rehabilitation officer. officer, right? So that he'll be, we'll give it, the parents got to be there, mm -hmm. right? And whatever that child is um, is charged with, we got to find a way to assist that child, right? And so we use the, the, the family, we use the CRO, we use the court to assist that child and try to avoid that child from going to jail. And by definition, a uh, child for the family court is under 18. Right. Any, anyone under 18 is a child mm -hmm. and must be treated so as such. a 17-year-old, 16-year-old who commits any form of crime right. would be before the family court. Before the family court. Now, I, wanna, I brought that out specifically because I know that that is one of the things that publicly we hear quite a bit about. Mm. Um, and, and perhaps being able to understand from your perspective right. why you view a 16 or 17-year-old criminal differently from a 20, 22 year old? Uh, I have studies that have shown that um, as, a, as a child or a young person, brain does not fully develop until like they are probably in their mid 20s or so on. Mm -hmm. uh, right? So this is the reason why sometimes when these, when these um, young persons commit these type of offense, they don't quite understand the consequences. And so it, there must be a program that where you can help them in understanding and know where they are and so you can assist them in developing into be a, a, a better person or be a citizen of, of this country. Mm -hmm. From your encounter, I, sorry, just, yes. uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a challenging job and I think uh, that, that uh, you know, we, we should be able to, to acknowledge that. Right. You are, as you rightly said, getting into the personal lives, not you personally, but the, the, the court, court right. um, and intervene when something is not going right, right. whether you are neglecting your child, uh, whether there is a family dispute right. of any kind, uh, divorces, which we know can be challenging with the maintenance portion, I mean, right. not divorces. Yeah, we'll get uh, to that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and even sometimes what, what I know once upon a time, I don't know if the term is still used, uncontrollable uh, right, children. Right, right, right. You can't right. discipline them, they're not listening. Right. Now, what is, what is your guiding principle in how you approach resolving disputes that really are about the personal lives of, of the individuals? Um, first of all, Marley, there is no blanket, there is no blanket answer to a, to a statement. You have to look at each individual case and, and, so, we, and so we can, we can assist them. For example, for example, like for some kids, maybe they're short of guidance and, and discipline. Mm -hmm. You can find some program that can guide them and discipline them. For example, family where there are disputes. I mean, you have seen where, f where brothers versus brothers, brother versus mothers, probably need some kind of counseling, you know? And so you have to look at each problem, diagnose, and then try to assist them or send them in the right direction so it can be resolved. Uh, I want to talk about the progress, because in this country, a lot of times we don't appreciate right. how far we've come. Whatever, if it's just three steps, we have to appreciate right. it. I remember when, because I used to. Yeah, right, I remember. Yes, yeah, you're right. Yes, I will I will probably quote. Yes, I was. Employee, he, was yes, yes. <laughs> he was there, I went to the good old days. A public officer, that's right. But I remember when I started to float vultures. Right, right. I would have to um, have huge lines. And there has been significant upgrades. Right. Could you talk about some of the upgrades? And maybe you can start with what's happening in Punta Gorda. All right, what happened is that, um, that in the first instant, um, the family court was only in Belize City. There's a mandate for family court to, to go countrywide. But however, I guess resources, the magistrate's court in the district would perform family court functions, which are not ideal. Because family court matters should be very private. You go in, you go into a room, you say in the officer, you're, you are discuss you're discussing a private confidential area. In the districts, it's not like that. Because it's the same magistrate who is the it's the same court magistrate, right? It's the same family court magistrate. Court, There's right. no separation. No separation, and also the clerk of courts are the one who would take your information. So imagine you go in front of a window and go and yes. spread your whole business to the clerk of court. That's just the way it works. And mm -hmm. uh, we have been lucky or fortunate to have a child friendly court in Punta, which was built probably I think a year or two ago. And I must say that that court is one of the the best court. I mean, I'm yeah. envy of it. It's beautiful. Yeah. The word, the wood that they use, the way it's designed. And so we have one now in Punta Gorda, which has done wonders for us. We were hoping to get one in San Ignacio. Yeah. We, have, we have the plans and everything, and then next thing our funding agency um, dried up, and so we have to seek funding again. So we're hoping that our next family court will be in San Ignacio. Mm -hmm. We're working on that. Yeah. And what's, what's the difference between what you call a child-friendly court? 
um, the, the difference is that what we, what we try to do is try to put the child in, in the forefront. Yeah. So, when, so when you go to court, for example, you go to court and you have, the, you have a child with you or your children, there's a space for them. Someone will, there, will be there to take care of them. There's somewhere where they, can, where they can relax, where they can go and play, or where they can go and read a book or something. Mm -hmm. And so that provides, provides, provides for a child. And this is, of course, to minimize the trauma yes. right. that a child would right. experience if they go into a system so, that right. doesn't cater to them. And also, you want to interview with them. The, yeah. the, 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 the place provides that, that there'll be somewhere where they feel comfortable to talk. Yeah. And I think the, the point has to be made as well that a court is an adult environment. Yeah. Right, right. And, and, and even adults, when they get into the environment, are intimidated. It's scary. I see it's police scary. officers <laughs> go to court yeah, intimidated. The court yeah. is scary. Yeah. And you don't want crime to be covered up because a child who's a witness, for example, is it's unable or feels uncomfortable. Because children clam up quicker than adults. Right. Of course. Right. You know? What are the primary... Uh, talk about what you see on, an, on, uh, on a yearly basis. Um, what are some of the main cases that are brought before you? It's funny, you know, one of our main cases is always maintenance. Mm -hmm. You know, um, for some reason, we seem, we seem to have a problem in, um, in, in, in providing for our, for, our, for our children. So that's one of our, our, our biggest challenge, challenges. Mm -hmm. And um, if we look at our juvenile situation, um, some years ago, we had a problem with possession of, 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 of marijuana. Mm -hmm. you know. But that has changed when the, when the law was, was, was changed from where you can have 10 yeah, grams the the criminalization yeah. of marijuana. So that not seems to be a major issue for us anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but would that still affect a minor? A minor ought not to. Yeah, but so far, um, I must admit that that has not been a major part of our. So of it used to be. But it used to be, changes, since the okay. change. Yeah, that has helped us a lot. Okay. Um, and we look at uncontrollable, you know. What is uncontrollable? <sighs> I That's brought up the term because I knew it used to be used. I don't know if it's still being it's used. It's still on the books. It it's still on the books. It's just, you have parents who have children who they can't control. For some reason, they can't control them. And for some reason, it's normally girls. Mm -hmm. They go to the court. I can't control this child. Can you please send a hostel for me, please? come on their knees, begging, crying, crying. I can't control the picnic. And so eventually the child end up, for some reason, at the youth hostel. But as a director of the family court, what, what, what's your process? I mean, there, is, there are children who make bad choices. Um, and oftentimes, I think that one of their deeper issues that are taking place. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much do you look into whether or not this is just a child that doesn't want to listen, if that's the case, right, or if there's something else that's taking place? Well, that's the reason why what we normally do is that we try to go into the, into, into the evidence, hear what the mother is saying, mm -hmm. and then we normally try to find an alternative for, alternative for them, because we understand them. They are young people. They want to explore. Maybe they are exploring the wrong things, and so maybe they need some kind of help. And so at that point in time, we try to, we try to get them into some, into some kind of help. We don't normally send them to youth hostel. That's the last choice. Mm -hmm. Because you don't want to be, you don't have no child in an institution. Okay. You want a child to be home with their family. So let's, let's tackle the, the big one first, <laughs> um, which I know that, that it continues to be um, a, a, an issue that we hear about, mm -hmm. maintenance. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, getting parents to meet their obligations. And I want to I challenge you with what is the first um, criticism that people usually have of the family court, which is that it, and Kevin will like this one with his machismo, yeah. that it is skewed <laughs> against men. Um, but we hear this so often that the family court is sympathetic to women and that it doesn't really provide as much for men as it does for women. So Pro Probably, I'm sure you've heard this criticism yes, before. Yes, yes, probably that could have been said in the inception. And it's not, um, wasn't a wrong criticism. Probably it was right. Because in the first inception, our laws, remember in our laws, a man, even if he had his child, couldn't take the one for maintenance. But that is not, our laws are no gender neutral. Mm. Right? Whatever applied to a female, applied to a male. So whatever a female can apply for, a man can apply for. So in, in that regard of, of, of being skewed, that I, I think now is, is behind us. Mm -hmm. Our laws have already adjusted that issue. The only problem in terms of, um, I think, where we have a, a single 
a single, a single woman with a child, she ha has full custody of that child, and the father does not have custody unless he applied to, to the court and can prove that she's an unfit mother. And so in that regard, there, that, there's, that seems to be an issue. And we've had this conversation before, right. and I think it's something that really ought to be um, explored a little bit more to unpack the conversation. The law says mm -hmm. that a mother mm -hmm. who is, has a, a child out of wedlock right. is entitled to and shall have. Custody. That is like double. <laughs> and right. it's actually in italics. That's right. That's right. I have argued that it's sexist, that it actually creates a default position right. based simply on nothing else other than gender. Yes, you can argue, but also you can have a different perspective, though, because if you are married, then that doesn't apply. If you are married, you have joint custody, right? So maybe, maybe I encourage us maybe to get married. I, I'm, I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying that. But yes, and I, I agree that, that that law probably need to, we need to look at it. Yeah. And it has created some hardship for, for, um, for, for some men, because imagine now you have to go to court and try to explain to this court that this mother is an unfit mother and there are only certain grounds that, 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 you, that you need, that you must prove. Yeah. So it, give, it really gives a difficulty for a man to have custody of his child. Yeah. And I think that era, will, at this point in time, we're looking at, at, at that era of your life. They're looking to change it. Right. Yeah. So, because it's an automatic assumption that the mother is the better parent, where yes. uh, it, that's not the case that's in all right, circumstances. Right, yeah. right, right. Evidence have shown that fathers are excellent, excellent yeah. parents. And there are quite a few great examples of single parent so, fathers as well. Right. Um, but, but going back to the maintenance issue, um, why are we still having these challenges today where uh, people have to go to the court? And there, there are actually a couple of things that people can do to make the process a bit easier. Um, I guess you're talking about the payment of maintenance. Yeah, the payment, quite, yeah. Right. What happened is that, um, like Kevin alluded to earlier, that earlier we, when it first opened, we had the voucher system. Mm -hmm. I was a part of the voucher system also. And now we have what we call smart, smart stream, which is computerized. Mm -hmm. They have computerized the back end, but the front end has not been computerized. So basically, mm -hmm. we are still working manual, mm -hmm. right? The process is when someone pay, you go to a cashier, you pay, a receipt is written up, person gets a receipt, you send the payment to Treasury, Treasury send back a payment number, then that system, then that information is then entered on smart stream. So we have several data entry clerk entering those, those, um, those, those payments on smart stream, which is about 8,000 or so a month. Um, Corozal have smart stream, Orange mm -hmm. have smart stream. Besides that, everything from the districts come to Belize City, and they must be entered by our clerks in Belize City. And then the approval is done by ourselves, um, the, the senior officers at the court. And so when you think about that process, that could take between a week to, to three weeks. Because imagine coming from, from, I got to post it, you know? So this is the reason why we are where we are. I however, hope that's being looked at too. However, I think that you just made, made a very good point on the 14th of March, Open of Supreme Court, where we have been working on a, um, on a, on, on computerization of the whole of the whole process, mm -hmm. you make a payment. I should go to the to the card and then go on smart stream and you know. Mm -hmm. But what happened is, is that we um we have a prototype that have been develop, developed by Mr. Ewins, um, the treasurer aware of it. They have seen it, and everybody see that it can work. But we have sent it to the persons who are in charge of providing the finance or to pay for it. And for some reason, and then we also get CETO involved. So, it, so it's a, the whole. It's ongoing. It's so, so at this point in time, we are hoping that finance can, that we can get finance for it. And hopefully that in this year or so, we can get that whole matter resolved. And matter can be, can be done faster. I, I want to go back a little in terms of the perception of the court. That it's slightly, for men, right. I, I know a lot of men feel as though you know, the court is not on their side, automatically go up there, they lose. Right. Um, how, how do you respond to people who say that even from the optics, that the percentage of male magistrates in the family court in Belize City in particular, mm. you're right. the only male there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and nationwide, in terms of who you go in front of, 
if you have a family problem, the likelihood is, I don't want to put a percentage on it, but it's surely over 60% that you'll be in front of a female. And of course, the females magistrates are equally as unbiased. Right. But just the perception, how do you respond to? I think um, that, because you know, like the, in earlier time, we used to have the lay magistrates. Mm -hmm. But now for us to be magistrate, you'll be, a, you'll be an attorney, you'll be fully qualified. And Kevin, if, I'm not sure what year you went to law school, but I mean, when I was in law school, to 100 students, 10 would be male. That was a problem. Right? And so, and, and so to me, that's an issue that, that's, that's beyond the us, court. beyond yeah. the court. So even if you say, all right, let me import some, 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 some magistrates from the Caribbean. We wouldn't want to do that. No, but I'm just arguing, you know the, the, the choices that probably would be women, because women are the ones who, who, are, who, are, who are going to school. So I, I, I'm not sure how you people address that issue, unless we, we encourage our, our... But is the, the, the dispensing of justice, I mean, that's what I'm saying, they're guiding principles. Um, that any one of the magistrates should have in how they would tackle a case if a male brings it to the court or a female brings yes, it no, to no, the no, court. Yes, no, there won't be no bias. Okay. Won't, and I'm sure, I'm sure those females are, are even competent or yeah. more competent, competent than, than the male. Yeah. So that's a problem of bias. So but I think Kevin is looking at the perception. Yeah, yeah absolutely. No, right? I understand. Right. That. I understand that. You feel if you go before a woman Moment. that they'll be sympathetic <laughs> towards a woman. But is it even that men are bringing cases? I mean, I, you yes. won't know you're going before a, a female magistrate. Once upon a time, I know uh, one of the education campaigns coming out of the family court was letting men know that they can come, if it's a custody issue especially, to formalize, have a court-approved uh, arrangement right. um, to ensure that their rights as a parent are being met. Right. Are you seeing more more men coming forward to ensure that they can get access to their children? I must admit that, that, that men are going to the court, especially when it comes to access and yeah. visitation. That is number one. Okay. I'm surprised to, to know, because we have societies that, that tend to be closed up, mm -hmm. even for domestic violence. Mm -hmm. You know, men don't want to say, man, I was abused by a lady. But no, they go to court for protection order. Men go to, but this is, this is a minority. Yeah. Men, men go to court, men take women to court for maintenance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, 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 uh, so that whole. So you're beginning to see an equal. Right. Uh, the, the shift. Equalizing. The sh right. The, yeah. shift, the, the shift is, it's slow, but, 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 but we are going there. We are going there. One of, one of the things, when I used to practice in the family court, I no longer do so. Uh, as you know. But we are welcome to practice with Kevin. You need quite come. a few pro bono lawyers, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Sign no, him no, up. No, I, no, I can't miss him because, you know, <laughs> he's tenacity in court. <laughs> but um, one, of, one of my issues when I practiced there was, was the quantum of maintenance. Um, and I used to always do this yeah. um, to go through the average maintenance. Uh, maintenance should be based on what the needs of the child are to keep the child on a certain right. stage of school. But there's this old practice that your, your average maintenance is going to be about $50, $75 a, $50 a week. Yeah. And when you do the division, it does up to anything. It adds up to maybe a dollar and something per day. Per so day. Like, yeah. um, is there a move to sort of have a different sort of approach to calculating? Right the quantum and to allow for either partner right. not to be able to hide their income. Right. Because some people just come to court and say, boss, I don't have well up. Yeah. I, I don't got no money. Yeah. And then it depends. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what happened is maintenance should be done by a means test. Get the person's salary, his expenses, and so on. But for some strange reason, the men that, has, that have a lot of children are the men with who are on the lesser or, get, or who are being paid less mm -hmm. for some reason. So when they do bring the salary to court and you look at their salary and their expenses and look at the much children they have, then you're like, but how is this possible? <laughs> and this is the reason why to me, which is um, unfair for, um, for, um, for, for, the, for the children. Yes. Yeah. It's not for the woman, it's for the child. Absolutely. I mean, the child now is being deprived of a good life because of the situation, but how can we change that? I guess we have to educate, um, are men on the lower end that you know you have to be responsible yeah, yeah. you know that you are responsible yeah. when you're irresponsible right but I, 
there's so much to talk about in so little time. Because I do want to dig deeper into the maintenance issue. And, yes, and you're right, because you said one of the most critical things, which, you know, I, I think oftentimes people view maintenance as giving to their ex-partner ex -partner. versus looking at the, the fact that it is needed to raise the, the child. Children. So a child, that's what partner. But we, we have another bigger issue coming up right now. Not bigger, but another equally important, which is the protection order. Right. And... Um, you know, we are living in a time where the issue of domestic violence, it's either one of two things. Right. It's either increasing or it's becoming more um, visible to us. And I, I can't say which one it is. You perhaps see more, you, you see enough cases to know. But we are seeing really sure, the worst course. cases because now we have people being killed on such a frequent yeah. basis that even the police department is talking about prioritizing the issue of domestic violence. Our next conversation is with the Blaise City Council about domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And a part of that protection from a potential homicide mm -hmm. starts in your court. Right. Can start in your court That's if true. it's accessed. So talk to us about what the laws are saying, what people can do and quite frankly, why these protection orders aren't working? Because we've heard the stories where people say, we got in the court, but well, the lady still end up dead. I think what happened in some cases is like protection, for example, protection is a, is a personal thing. Someone might be in an abusive, abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. They want to get out. Sometimes they don't know how to get out. They go to the court, they apply, the matter is served. The court is prepared to go, and then the party would write a letter or call the court or go to the court and ask that this matter be withdrawn. We have worked out our differences, mm -hmm. right? So it's not that the person doing the person need protection, but the person don't know how to get out. Mm -hmm. So I guess at that point in time, we need, we need to find some way as to empower that individual as to how to get out of a domestic um, uh, out, of, out of a domestic abusive relationship. Yeah. Um, you have some, some, some I think, um, department that provide, in the first in instance, somewhere for them to stay and yeah. hide, which is private. Yeah. I think that we, they need to get out there more and so that people can know what their options are. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I will admit that the, the law itself is very, is, is very stiff. You know, it provides that if you, if you found breach of a, a protection order, you can be fined and confined up to four years. You can charge up to ten thousand dollars. What are the grounds for getting a protection order? What do I have to prove if I want to get a protection yeah, no, order? I'm sure that, that you have been um, that you have been um, abused physically, um, socially, um, psychologically, or, uh, or mentally, or sexually, mm -hmm. or any kind of abuse, mm -hmm. it, and it's a bunch of probability. But there. see, the the proof part is where it's hard because if no. I go when my if I never took photographs of of what was done to me and i go when i'm all healed up and i look normal in front of you no they, uh, no no they will listen to what you have to say and if you and you can prove that that you have been abused then it, it's, it's not it's not difficult okay it's not it's not beyond a reasonable doubt it's about a probability okay and and the magistrates are specifically trained right to be able to decipher between what is a lie okay. right and what is the truth so it's a specialized court that's, yeah. that's the reason why it's there but I wanted you to talk a little bit about the tools because there's some new tools with the upgrade in the Domestic Violence Act. For example, the ability of the magistrate to send the parties to counsel, depending because they are skills. No, no, we, we try. Yeah, well, yes, they are yes, skills. They are skills, right? The uh, law also provides that, that that you can send the uh, the party to counseling, maybe the man he did counseling, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you also provide that whereby that there is a um, um, there a tenancy order, where, whereby whereby the man can the, the, the perpetrator. Can be can be ordered to pay house rent, pay maintenance, and so on. While that person is is hide somewhere, mm -hmm. right? So so a lot empower empower the magistrate to do certain things to assist to protect the victim. To protect the victim. Now you, you you said something very briefly, and and I thought it was worthwhile to explore further because we have a clear definition, or I think we have a presumption as to what. Uh, domestic violence is right. um, and we really imagine a, a woman with a bust up face no. and that's the only <laughs> form no uh, no 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 Mary, it's not, I'm not laughing because it's yeah, funny, right? I'm laughing yeah. because no no yeah. no and and it usually starts if it get long before that you know there is emotional abuse emotional abuse there is financial abuse, abuse there is sexual yeah. violence in relationships right. and marriages right 
And how much do you find that people are aware that these are things that can be brought to the court? In other words, when I am so confined that I don't have a dime in my name, maybe I'm not being beaten. Right. Maybe I am just a prisoner. That's right. So it, it belongs to, to that people need to be educated. You know, um, there's a bar association. Um, Kevin is right here, attorney. Mm -hmm. People need to find where they can speak to someone. And you got the, um, the, the women's department. Mm -hmm. Speak to someone who can assist them in their situation. And there are so many entities out there that can guide them. Go to the family court. We have intake officers who can sit down with you and talk to you and guide you and tell you what you need to do. Mm -hmm. You know, so this is not rocket science, you know. This can be done, I mean, on a, on a daily basis. And there's, I really, I really respect where, where the law is. Um, the playing out of the law is something else. But where the law is, I think we've done a pretty good job as a country. Right, yeah, right. Because a simple thing like, because we're talking about how to get out, a simple mm -hmm. thing like the law provides under the Domestic Violence Act that these matters have to be heard in court within, within three days. Right. Mm -hmm. And if it's urgent, you, you, can, you can go immediately. In, get to get to other immediately. So why are we in this situation from your perspective? I would go back to saying the same thing that probably we don't know. Yeah. You know, we probably don't know what we are. Or, or on the other aspect, we can look at um, maybe people are afraid to, 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 to just venture out from out of a situation. Maybe where do I go? I got, where do I sleep? Where do my kids live? Mm -hmm. You know, they need to be empowered. Mm -hmm. and if they are empowered, then that situation can be resolved. And, we, and, and for some reason, uh, people go to court and they go over and over, then eventually they, they decide to yeah, proceed. Yeah, it's a cycle. It's That's why it's called know? a cycle. Yeah. Right? Uh, you know, and so, so family, family, family issues are very difficult because you can't understand that person would not pursue um, whatever they are going through at this point in time and they just go right back into, into it. It's very yeah. difficult to understand. But, you know, people say, and I've heard it, one well, piece of paper now protect me. No, that paper is sent to the police station when it's given to you and the next party. This is a technology. Everybody got a cell phone. The man come within 50, 50 yards. You call police. Police must charge him for breach of a protection order. Mm -hmm. Hold him before, before he, he uh, pull him. And if he's given any trouble, then you can just, um, he, the bill can be denied. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he can, so, so, so that paper can. Can, can I see somebody in, in, a, in a situation? Yeah. yeah. Um, How often do you see people seeking protection orders? That's a daily basis. That daily. One, that's a daily basis, and it's a very huge part of the courts. Well, mm. no. I, I have to go back a little to touch again on, on an issue in terms of one of the complaints that some of the persons who are paying maintenance have. Right. Normally, it's meals. Mm -hmm is sometimes they feel as though the money is not being directed to their child. For example, in a household where you have a, a mother who has children that have different um, fathers. Right. You have one father who isn't paying, right. and you have the one father who is paying, is paying right. and he tends to do the whole household. And a lot of men feel, who are paying, that listen, this, this is really unfair. Right. What can be done in terms of because it goes both ways. You can't just have a right without a responsibility. Right. What can be done by a parent, a father or a mother, a who person feels that they're a person paying maintenance, who feels as though I'm paying maintenance, but it's not going to my child. It's going to my ex-girlfriend's here <laughs> style <laughs> and to ex-boyfriend yeah. and the baby a Friday. Right. What can be done in terms of monitoring where your maintenance is being paid and where it's reaching your the, child? The law provides for the misuse of maintenance, right? Um, that if you can prove that the Money is used for other things, and, you, and so then the yeah. law would then resolve that issue. Yeah. But however, though, like you said earlier, these men are, are, they are paying minimal maintenance. Do you think in consideration that this child needs to eat mm -hmm. water, light, and every other thing that entertainment? Mm -hmm. So how can whatever school, school doctor bill, so how can this little whatever you are given can cover for the, for, for, um, um, for, for, the, for the other children who father is not paying. So it doesn't make much sense. The argument seems to be mute to me, yeah. right? So, um, but yes, the law provide, provide. If you can prove if it, you can if prove the it. child doesn't have right. like the school fees paid, for example, you would be able to take that as a, as a legitimate You're probably right. issue you at court. court right. 
And, you know, I always, when I think of family court sometimes, and because we've heard some of the stories previously, it has got to be hard to hear some of these stories oh, that difficult. come forward. It's difficult. But I mean, when you hear of sexual abuse cases, right. child abuse cases, right. and you have to hear, I mean, it is where you hear the real deterioration of what is taking place within our society before it gets to the, the criminal uh, right. isu issues that end up in the news. How, what do you think is one of the, 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 the root causes uh, as to why we see some of these crimes that are done within the family? Um, are we poor? Uh, we always hear people say, oh, it's I because we're think, poor, no, we're uneducated, think, or what? Think, I don't think it's poverty, though. I'm not sure as to why, uh, why we, well, I think it's just poor parenting skills. You know, I think that we, we, need, to, we need to learn to, or, it, or maybe, the old adage of it takes an uh, uh, raise a child. We uh, probably we move away from our, our, you know, something. But we, I really can't put my hand as to why we are where we are. Mm -hmm. I wish I could, but I can't. Mm -hmm. You know, but uh, the best we can do at from the court is try to mitigate the circumstances. Yeah. And speaking of mitigating circumstances, can can you address the the myth out there right. that somehow if a father is not or a partner is not paying, most times it's a father not paying maintenance, that. You're not going to see the big name. <laughs> and, and to separate yeah, the two as yeah, to the well-being yeah, of the child. Yeah. We, we need to understand that maintenance and access two different things. Two separate issues. Maybe there are reasons why you can't pay maintenance. Maybe you are sick. What does that mean that you can't see a child? You know? So, 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 so we need to keep them separate. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I, I, was, I was saying, I was mentioning earlier, just in terms of even if you have an agreement, a verbal agreement, right. it's still good to formalize it in front of the court. Right. Because it can't be that I get mad today, so I just won't see it, let, allow you to see your child. That's a problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. When it, uh, this is the reason why a, a court order may be very necessary in, in those situations. Yeah. Because when somebody gets mad tomorrow and then the, the, then the child became real call like like the battering tool mm -hmm. you know uh, not sure picnic mm -hmm. because whatever whatever yeah. whatever mm -hmm. and then that could escalate into something else yeah right, i have seen it yeah so this is the reason why if there's an order in place you get a copy of your order you want to see your child this is your time you take it the police have the called domestic violence unit you take it to them they'll assist you mm -hmm. and the person will write to them i'll give, give, I'll give you a child what happens in a situation where for example a father gets access to a child every alternate weekend, which is almost standard. Right. And the father does not take up the access of visitation for a month. And right. he comes up, shows up, because he's trying to get back right. with the mother and says, I want to see it's the child. child. Mm -hmm. What yeah. happens then? That's very problematic. That's very problematic. I would, ask them, I would ask them to go back to the court and see how we can resolve that issue and see why he's not going for his child. Maybe there might be some reason that, that, that he's not going for it. Um, um, for example, they are. So it's very problematic. So it's best to go back to the court and see how we can resolve it. But however, though, the order is the, is the order of the court and that order stands. So my advice would be, if, he, if a month ago, his week, your week, his final week, and you have that mark on your calendar, it is this week, give him the child. Then you go back to the court and then from Afterwards. there. Afterwards. Right, and then, and then you complain the other. When you say you're complaining, you complain. <laughs> complain with the other, then go, then go and complain. One of my favorite mechanisms of the court, that I still do actually, right. is applications under the Hague. And we've seen right. a recent one, mm -hmm. right. and we had the first one, well, the last one, uh, with baby Nina that, right. that I was involved in. Um, do you find that the effectiveness of the court in that area has actually deterred some of the temptation that a parent might have to just take the child and leave? I don't think it's a court. I think it is a global mechanism in place that I don't know if you realize recently that for you to travel with your child, you need some kind of document from the father. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? So globally, um, that matter, uh, that has deterred everyone. So if you're going, you go to tomorrow. Yeah. You need a letter to take your, take your child across the border. Yeah. So that matter has been resolved. And next thing to that, we have to understand that um, whilst you have a child, a mother, or a father, you just can't take your child to any country without the other parents know where a child is going. Because under the Hague, under the Hague Convention, the child will be coming back. 
Right? So I think that that issue, and I think the media has done a wonderful job in letting everyone know that they just can't take your child, kidnap your child, whatever, or whatever they used to do in, in the good old days. Mm -hmm. All right? So I think, we, I think we have done a wonderful job with, with, that, with that aspect. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I, I just, I'm, I'm trying to figure out because really the family court protects the family unit. Right. And uh, perhaps a primary function in protecting a family is not the, the preservation of the family, not, not only the preservation of the family, but the quality of life right. of the children. And I mean, I'm just trying to be honest here about some of the things that we are seeing and hearing and we know takes place within society, when, whether anecdotally or through the news or what we see in our own neighborhoods. Cases of neglect, yeah. um, how often do you hear that? And what do you, uh, who can bring a case of neglect? And what can you do to prevent children from uh, not having the proper parenting that they need? Um, and that's why from the court we, are, we have partners, like we have the um, human development. Mm -hmm. They normally apply for what they call a care order. Yeah. And we know that neglect happened. And so that department... What is the definition of neglect? Let, let me... Um, ne ne where, where, you, where, you can, where a child um, is not properly cared for, where mm -hmm. a child is um, not... Um, they're, they're not um, providing nutrition, mm -hmm. somewhere to sleep. Mm -hmm. They're wondering about wondering at 11. About, uh, yeah, so all those not things. going to school. Yeah, locked, school. In school. locked in a house. Locked in a house, house. <laughs> alone. Alone. <laughs> so, so, I mean, we can go on. And so, while the human development officer would get wind of that or no, do the investigation, they can go right there and then remove that child. Mm -hmm. And so, the child can then be removed. And within 48 hours, then go to the court and get to a call of care rather. So, if I'm a neighbor and I see that my, the, the people that live next door. Right. Uh, don't worry about where their children go. Right. Um, leave and lock the children in. Right. And I call human services. I see that there's some type of removal that, that took place and they went to court. Right. And then a week later, I see the child back there again. How do you explain that to people when well, they've gone through the family court well, system? What happened is that it wouldn't be a week. I'm just, right. a, I'm just a, saying, yeah. I'm just okay. saying, well, it should, it should, if it, it's a week, something it is wrong. It shouldn't be a week. It shouldn't okay. be a week. Thank because you. what happened is that then, that then they would need to have some kind of work plan with, with, with that family. Mm -hmm. So there must be some kind of counseling, some, something that, that that family would know how to deal with, with that situation. Mm -hmm. So you got to work with them first, and then the child can then go back, go back home to the family. Mm -hmm. And that can be the same as a neighbor who observes physical abuse or it, right. suspects sexual it, abuse. That's right. No. Um, you, you sit in a seat where you can sit on top of the hill and watch the partners, right. um, whether it's the CRO officers it's or it's... Top of the hill, no. we, should, we should be at the same it's, level. It's right, right, it's right, right, we should be, right. But you're top of the heap. That's, that's right, where you are. Right. And, and, and you have to be that way because you're administrating as well right. and monitoring the progress. I want to give you the opportunity to, to, to both speak to the progress that we've made in terms of the staffing of the court itself, but also the auxiliary officers, like the Human Services Department, right. who seem to have made strides forward right. um, in the leadership there. Um, and I also wanted you to, I know you're a forward-thinking individual. We've, we've spoken about some of your right. ideas that are going to be on stream. But can you tell us where, we're, we've already had 30 years right. behind us. Right. Can you talk about where we're going in the next 30 years? Well, uh, for me personally, um, as a team, you know, um, team leader, I believe for family court, we have to look at, um, for example, now we are doing mediation, mm -hmm. right? Mediation are part of, we, we, I mean, in, the, in, in our new renovated family court, we have, we have mediation. So many of our matters are settled by the parties, right? So mediation is, is, is something new for us. And, and what we need to do, we need to have family court in every district. Because the people in the district, they need the same type of support as give, that is given to Belize City and Punta Gorda. And furthermore, the, the system, we need to urgently computerize that system. Urgently, so that all mothers, because it's a simple process, you know, the father pay the money, the mother get the money. Mm -hmm. You understand? So why should that take three weeks? When, I mean, this is not rocket science. There are so many technological advances that have made over the years. I mean, everybody, the banks do it, the companies do it. So why, so why, why, why we can't do it? Yeah. So I'm hoping that, yeah. that, that we can get that done in a more efficient manner and, and, and we'll be fine. 
All right. Well, this is only scratching the surface on, on the extent of the work uh, that the Family Court does, but it is a good opportunity to remind people that it exists, um, to access the services that you offer, and to be able to, to do what they can to ensure uh, that the family is preserved, whatever type of family right. that is, right? Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to go ahead and take a break, and when we come back, we'll be talking about an upcoming conference. It's called Break the Silence and Speak Up. So stay tuned.